maybe. All right, it's recording. All right. Well, welcome to crowdfunding for real estate. I'm gonna, I walk around a lot. Uh, if you have questions, raise your hand, and I will. Uh, I'll do my best to get it. Uh, like I said, we're recording it, so uh, I'm gonna. It will be a course on Udemy.com. How to crowdfund your next real estate deal. And I don't have a clicker, but let's see. Uh,
I have uh, several different workshops that I do. Uh, introduction to Securities Based Crowdfunding 101. Uh, I see some people from Crowdfunding 101. This is the real estate uh, two hour version. We also did a film one at the ad school. They're all similar but a little bit different. I was, uh, when I was at the FDIC, it was a little stressful. So, uh, you know, at one point they would take my cell phone number and you know, when a bank closed, they put the piece of paper up there and they were putting my cell phone there for the person to contact because I was running the contract. So every time a bank closed, I did like a million calls. It was nobody's happy when a bank closed down. The customers aren't, the depositors aren't. So it was just a very stressful job. So in 2010, when I left, I got a decent payout. I went to Paris and I went to uh, art school over there. So I had a little bit of an artistic side of it. And you know, what I learned over there was that, boy, if anybody needs help with the money side, it was at least my fellow students over there. So I created a few courses on that. I guess I get on the topic. Look, so if you want, uh, so we're starting a new fund, we have a new brokerage, we have, you know, I seek at a lot of events. So if you want to talk with me and you want to work with me, I'm happy to help, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm 1,200 emails back now. And we will, uh, the best thing is go to my site, Crowdfunding Renegade. Uh, you can go, you can contact me, just schedule a time. I do the first half hour for free to talk out with your projects with you. If it's a little more in depth and it's something that interests me, we'll talk about it. I'll be involved or I'll refer you to the, to the right person to help you out. The good thing about crowdfunding is it's, you can self host it, by the way, so you don't need a consultant, but you'll see that it does get a little, little bit big. You can come, you can always click on here. I've got a lot of live events. You know, I'm a bit of a whore, so I like getting up in front of people and talking, so you'll see me around Miami. I've done several. And then online, we'll report them also. How I got into crowdfunding. Uh, is this okay? Is this pace okay? Uh, all right, good. So I stumbled out. So when I left the FDIC and I got back from Paris, uh, a friend of mine got a huge government contract and I was a business development guy. And basically, I had the opportunity just to sign up. He's like, hey, we'll find out what's new. And I could sign up to any seminar, any conference that I wanted to. And around 2010, 2011, I stumbled on to crowdfunding, securities-based crowdfunding, which is different than Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which we're about to get into. But, you know, at the time, it was a bunch of weirdos kind of looking for, you know, funding for algae farms. But I got it immediately, and not a lot of people got it immediately. Um, and I've been doing workshops and assisting people with crowdfunding, mostly teaching crowdfunding uh, since then. Um, a little bit about crowdfunding. We hear a lot about crowd. We're going to get into the job tech in a second. Um, I know I need to circle back up there, but we're going to that. So crowdfund, crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is common. So during the downturn, a lot of people talk about what, how bad it was, and you know how uh, miserable the economy was at the edge of the cliff. But a lot of good things happened. The advent of social media and the proliferation of social media. But exactly what's going on? But uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, the broadband proliferation reached further into U.S. households than ever before, and it's really made the crowdsourcing, the crowdfunding, and um, the peer-to-peer -peer lending and everything really a viable option. Uh, crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsourcing is uh, things like Elance, where you can hire third-party people to assist you in developing projects. So we're going to go through a lot of this stuff, and you know, when you're dealing with other people's money, professionalism, professionalism is key. And if you don't have the skill, sites like Elance and Craigslist is a good one. And uh, you know, there are a million crowdsourcing sites where you can source everything from you know, PhD mathematicians in the Eastern Bloc of Russia to help you with your Excel spreadsheets, to graphic designers around the corner that we have to do it at a reasonable price with great quality, by the way. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is what we're talking about. It's where you put up an offering and the crowd comes in and, and funds it. Next is, uh, here's an example of probably one of the more famous ones of the rewards-based crowdfunding. Everyone, who's heard of Oculus Rift, by the way? Anybody? So Oculus Rift is a, a virtual 3D gaming console or uh, goggles. So you put it on, plug it into your co computer and you merge it. Hey, I got mine set up. Uh, thank you for coming. He's a friend of mine. He's offering a video pick for all of us so that I can upload it. So thank you, Jim. Uh, but uh, so look, they didn't have the money to do it. They put up the designs, and we really get into this a little bit more in crowdfunding 101 and the marketing and everything. They raised 2.5 million dollars. The next year, uh, Facebook bought them off for 2.5 billion. That's a thousand percent return on your money. So that means if you invested 100 dollars in Oculus Rift, you would have got a 10,000 dollar payout in a year. But this is rewards based, so a lot of people are pissed off. But we'll, we'll get into it as soon as we have some of those. Uh, Anyways, as soon as we have some of those in securities-based crowdfunding, it's going to go crazy. 
But security is great, it makes crowdfunding. So, how many people have raised money before from private sources, from individuals? So few. All right. So if you're starting a company or you want to, if you want to uh, raise money, you can't just go out there and have people start giving you money. It's against the law. It's against the securities law. That's why we have companies that go public and access the public markets. Right? There's a whole set of securities laws. You have to hire a broker dealer. It's very expensive, and we'll get into some of the costs of it. And so, so. During the downturn, what happened during the downturn is that all of these financial markets kind of froze up and access to capital was kind of cut off and people started to panic. And so a lot of the laws didn't really make a lot of the laws that are written to raise money, and we'll get into that in a second, uh, really don't make sense for small businesses, right? They're too cost prohibitive, broker dealers, professionals have to get into it, and they really won't take small offerings. So a group of broker dealers out of South Florida, Sherman, uh, uh, Sherwood East and Jason Best said this is crazy, and they went up to the uh, to the U.S. They went up to Washington, and they said hey, we got to do something about this. And they came up with the job the Jobs Act, which is the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. Typically, a law to get passed, especially a securities law, takes about 10 years. They were able to do it in 10 months because everyone recognized that the, the world, especially the fundraising world, had changed with the proliferation of social media and broadband media, that the rules had to go with it. So they came up with the Jobs Act, and this is called Securities-Based Crowdfunding. We're going to get into the different titles here. There's a Title Three and a Title Two. Granted, this law passed in 2012. This is what this is beyond. This law passed in 2012, right? But once a law passed, it goes to the regulators and the overseers or overseers, overseers, and they have to write the rules and regulations before it becomes effective, right? In the law, the Jumpstart Our Business Act law, it says uh, that they had 90 days to write these. It's, it had 90 days to write the law. We still don't have the law written on Title Three, which is the true crowdfunding, where unaccredited investors can invest. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that as it goes. Any, is, that, is this pace okay? I mean, this is even fast for me, and I talk fast. How are we? Right. I got a recording every 20 minutes. We'll shut it off and do it. So we're going to turn this into kind of like a workshop, and then we'll just use these as the base, and I'll fill in. Right. And I'll give everybody the code, by the way. I appreciate you kind of coming along with me on this journey. But I think you'll see it's hard. Right. So if you're going to raise money, you got the securities laws. Yes? Morning paper, but it's more than just And interstate crowdfunding exemption? We'll get into that. That's a good question. So if you're going to do it, uh, if you want to raise money, you have to abide by the securities laws. You can go to jail for uh, raising money without a securities license. If you write the exemption and it's wrong, uh, you can, you'll have to refund back all their money. So there are strict laws and guidelines that you have to follow to raise money for a company. Uh, the different types that you can do, you can go public. Uh, IPO was just announced today for Fitbit, I think, right? So to go public, the route to go public is that you have to hire a professional broker dealer, right? It costs roughly four million bucks to go public on one of the big stock exchanges. And the broker dealer is doing it as his business, so he needs to make money. So he ain't gonna do anything, he's not gonna take you public unless you're looking for about 100 million bucks. And if he can't, if he doesn't think he can do it, I should say he, if they don't think they can do it, they won't, they won't take you on, right? So there are whole types of exemptions around going public, right? So the government says if you're gonna go public and raise money from the average person, you need to you need to go public through a broker dealer, right? But not everybody's looking for hundred million, they're okay. Uh, now everybody's looking for $100 million, so they said, all right, well, we'll get some exemptions to going public. The most common is called a rate B exemption, right? There are different types. There's a 504, a 505, and a 506. We'll, we'll get into it uh, on the Udemy course if you're really interested. So it says, look, if I'm only raise, going to raise a little bit of money, maybe a million dollars for my startup, what I can do is I can go to an attorney, or I can probably do this yourself, but I don't know if I would, and I can write a private placement memorandum. What the hell is that thing? So here's an example of our private placement memorandum. So this is uh, this is a 506C, right? This one cost us $35,000 to write. But what it does is it lays out the opportunities, gives a nice little spreadsheet. I'll pass it around. You can look at it if you want. I don't know. It's 35 grand though. No, I'm just kidding. No, that one definitely was. But so you get an attorney to do it. Right? And then it comes into who you can raise money from. So there's an accredited investor and an unaccredited investor. And it has to do with their net worth. And we'll break it down a little bit later, but I'll definitely get into it in 
Where are we at with time? Three minutes, four minutes, buddy. So we'll definitely get into it on the uh, video part, right? So if you're gonna raise money, you wanna raise money from what's called an accredited investor. This is someone who has a net worth of over 250,000. Uh, or has an income of 250000 a year, or a net worth of a million dollars, not including their primary residence. Yeah, I think it might have changed a little bit with the Jobs Act, but that's roughly what it is. So these people are, uh, and then the next is unaccredited, people who do not have this wealth level, right? So during the 1929, the Great Depression, what happened is, is that they were selling securities left and right, there was a lot of fraud going on, and then uh, it was the hottest thing, it was like real estate 10 years ago down here, right? Everybody was in it, and when it collapsed, the government had all these people with no money, and they had to take care of them. They had to bail them out of their situation, not that they did, but that was kind of the predicament that they had. And so they passed all these laws, the Securities Act, the uh, 33, 34, and basically what they did is they bifurcated the, or separated the population between people who had accredited status and had the ability to hire third-party consultants to look over their shoulder, lawyers, accountants, consultants, to make sure that it was okay, and then everybody else that's unaccredited, right? So when you go to raise money from unaccredited individuals, you have to be very careful because uh, their accreditation status can affect your raise. We won't get too deep into it. We will on the, the set we're getting, all right? So these securities laws, uh, going public costs four million bucks roughly, right? An exemption anywhere from, depending on the attorney you hire, 35,000 bucks and up, and that's just to get the material, right? And then you have to distribute it. And then, uh, then they came up and uh, these laws were around for 80 years until the last depression that we were in, right? And they said, all right, this just isn't working, right? So they came up with the Jobs Act, which is the, the first major rewrite of these securities laws in 80 years, and that's what we're gonna get into. Jobs Act has different titles. We'll talk about them in a second. These are the ones that are important. Title II came out a year ago. Title III is still not legal. Title IV just happened. We'll get into it a little bit more. Comments, questions, complaints, concerns, suggestions? All right, like it. Jumpstart America, I think that this will be the biggest thing that came out of Obama's uh, administration. I mean, uh, only two, only one title is really legal right now, and it's already changing the way money's raised, and that's a Title II, which we'll get into. In here, Title Three, which is unaccredited people who can invest. Before in the old securities, you were limited. So if I were going to do a 506C type of offering, right, I could have up to 35 unaccredited investors invest. I could have as many. So you want to stop and start that again? So I could have as many. One, one second. I could have as many unaccredited investors I want, up to 2,000. Once you hit 2,000 investors in your company, you got to go public, right? But I could have up to 2,000 and only 35 unaccredited, right? So Title three kind of is what changed that. Anyways, we good, buddy? Any questions, comments? Is this okay? Are we going? We'll get into the, the nitty gritty. I got 60 slides. I don't know if we'll do all of them, but we'll do our best. All the ones at the Idea Center are out of focus, so I focus that, by the way. <laughs> that was, sounds good. Good man. All right. Here, so here's the Jobs Act. There, here are the different titles, right? Basically what, what the Jobs Act was intended to do was make it easier for smaller companies to raise money, right? Uh, the first one, Title I, it created a new type of company called an emerging growth company. Don't worry about it. Title II, access to capital for job creators. So this is the one that's making all the impact all the way in real estate. Uh, it's what it's the exemption that Realty Mobile uses. How many people have heard of Realty Mobile? or Fundrise, or Patch of Land, who I did a presentation with the other day. These are called crowdfunding portals, right? They use, so Title II allows you to, you can get a Title II offering, you can get it for as low as $2,500. You can even get a template to do it yourself. The portal will even help you do it. So the cost went from $35,000 for a 506 to a Title II to $2,500 or even lower if the portal does it, right? Oh, look, let me just make it clear. I am not an attorney. Uh, I'm not a CPA and I'm not a broker dealer, right? So this is just my opinion. And if you're going to do this, you need to get a professional to look over your shoulder. Or go with a portal that, um, we'll talk about portals, all right? I should have put that disclosure in, right? All right, anyways. So we'll talk, we'll get, we'll get a little bit deeper. Did you restart the timer? All right. Yeah. We'll get no. a little bit deeper into uh, Title II later. Title III is the, the crowdfunding. What this will do is allow unaccredited investors and accredited investors to invest in your offering. So everybody thinks that this is going to be the big revolution. It's still not legal. It was supposed to be legal in two, 90 days in 2012. 
It's still not. Basically, the chairman of the, S uh, the SEC, she said that, look, I don't believe in this, uh, uh, and I'm just not going to pass it during my administration. You can, you can take it up after that. So she, I think she's out, and they think it will be legal at the end of the year. The thing is, is that there are a lot of restrictions and, and, uh, uh, and due diligence requirements. They're actually creating a new uh, type of broker-dealer, which is called a funding portal or a mini broker-dealer. So we'll see if Title III has as big an impact. You can only raise a million a year per calendar year. Unaccredited investors can only invest up to 10% of their income, capped at 5,000 if you're under 100. So we'll see uh, if it has, uh -oh. We'll see if it has any effect. Title IV just came. This is a small company. This just became legal 60 days ago. It took 60 days, so you should, this, this they believe will have the big revolution. What the, the revolution is, what this allows you to do is to go public away from the big pop, the public stock exchanges. We'll dig into it a little bit. This combined with the, the market's increasing their tick size. So right, a tick size is at the minimum Number, the minimum price per share. So right now it's at a penny, right? And then it's, it's kind of going toward five cents and 10 cents. So that tick side increase, along with this Title IV, it, it will, we're, we're moving into the golden era of uh, micro cap sub 50 million IPOs. And this is the one that's going to have the biggest game changer. Uh, title five, six, and seven, I don't even know what they are. Uh, I do, but they're not important. All right, Title two, five hundred six c exception, right? So when you want to go raise money, you're going to have to get uh, an offering memorandum is what it's called, right? I can't just go and say, hey, I want you to invest in it. I'm going to have an offering memorandum. You're seeing my 506C going around now, right? Uh, the crowdfunding portal, you will have that. You know, I know, I know a lot of people like numbers, so this is called a 506C uh, exemption, aka crowdfunding for rich people. Some of the provisions on this, and like I said, in Udemy, we'll get into this a little bit deeper, and we will also, but it'll explain it. Some of the things about uh, the 506C that's available, like Realty Mogul and Patch of Land, it's only for accredited investors right now, right? And so with this 506C that I have right here, only, uh, well, there's an exemption for some unaccredited, but the accredited investors, all they have to do is I give them a piece of paper and they tell me they were accredited. Does that make sense? It's called self-certifying. This new one, you have to make sure that they're accredited. Whether that means you talk to their CPA, blah, blah, blah. We'll move in. Questions, comments, complaints, concerns? All right, title three. This is the one everybody's waiting for. It's called 4A6 exemption from the registration provisions of the Securities Act. This is still proposed as a quarter, second quarter. Are we in the second quarter? Yeah, we're in the second quarter. Uh, so it's still proposed, right? So we won't talk too much about it. This is title four. It's called Reg A Plus. So there's a, a little known exemption to going public. This over everybody's head. We'll get into real estate and how it affects here first. I just wanted to dive deep into securities. So it'll be on Udemy, but we'll get into it. But so this, uh, so there was a Reg A plus, and basically the way it worked is that you could only raise five million dollars, right? But you have to register with every state. It's called a form D. You'd have to file. So you'd have to have an attorney in every state. You'd have to register with every state, and for five million bucks, it's cost prohibitive. Right? So they modified that. They updated it. It's called Reg A Plus. And now it's, there are two tiers to it. One is for 20 million, one is for 50 million. One allows you not to have to register, but unaccredited investment to. All right. Uh, all right. Some of the, uh, I'll email you this presentation too. Some of the different types of exemptions. Uh, you want to go over it? You want to get into real estate? We'll get into real estate. Uh, all right. So. You were talking about interstate crowdfunding. So those, what I just went over are the, the, the federal exemptions to raising money. So if you wanted to go public, it's federally, federally regulated. There are 20, 12 states so far that have interstate crowdfunding offerings that may allow you to raise money from unaccredited investors. Florida, I think you said it was going today, that's the first I've heard. Okay. But today? Okay. All right, so 13 states. Uh, that's good. Right. So we'll see where are we at. Okay. All right. Questions, comments, complaints, concerns? Well, there you go. I think it'll pass. I mean, it's, it kind of makes sense. We'll see. I mean, is this all? Is everybody following along? Or is this a little bit too much right in your face right away? Uh, by the way, this is a, uh, like I said, this is an AR course that we, we really get into uh, the securities part of it. And if you're going to do an offering, you need an attorney, you need a broker dealer, or you need the guidance of a professional. And with the offer, because here's why. 
Because if I mess up on that exemption, and let's say that I raised, that one was for $20 million. We didn't raise $20 million on it, but we were looking to raise $20 million. Let's say that I raised the $20 million, and I messed that up, then uh, it blows the exemption out, and I would have to, I could, the, the investors could ask for their money back. Does that make sense? And you can get in trouble for raising money. I mean, so, you, unless you don't know what you're doing, unless you know what you're doing, you need a professional. How are we time? All right, choosing an exemption. So it really depends on how much money you want to raise, right? Five million, 10 million, 50 million. So look at the type of offering that you're, you're, you're looking, or look at the amount of money that you're trying to raise. Look at the type of people that you have access to you, and then consult with a professional and they'll kind of give you guidance. So all of the other exemptions, the 505, the 504, the 506, they're still legal and they still have, they, they still be a, may be a good way to go. Crowdfunding is kind of the sexy thing right now. But the other exemptions have been around for $80, and I think that there was close to a trillion dollars raised in rate the exemptions, mostly through institutions, but in, in 2012. All right. So I get this a lot. Is that a, so can you guys, can I help somebody, can I help somebody do a crowdfund offering? That's what I get. So can I make money doing a crowdfunding offering? They say yes. So you got to be careful, you can't charge a fee based on the amount of money that they raise. It can't be uh, based on the total raise, unless you're a licensed broker dealer. But I, this industry needs crowdfunding consultants. They need people, to, because you can see just on the securities part, it's a little bit, it gets deep, fast, and uh, people need expert guidance. So you can charge a fee to help people put these offering packages together. Uh, I'm going to send, uh, I'll, I'll give you Scott Purcell's book, uh, on crowdfunding, and he teaches a great course on uh, how to become a certified crowdfunding professional. But you can make money on it, and we are really, like I said, of the six titles, of the three titles that are relevant to raising money through crowdfunding, really only one has been legal for a year and a half. One just became legal, and the other one's still on the horizon. So it will have a huge impact on how money is raised, and people need help. All right, what is an accredited investor? I think we talked about that. Just a, a quick thing about crowdfunding, we talk about this, is that an average of 60% of all crowdfunding offerings fail. So this is not security based, by the way. There's a much higher average of success in securities. But in general, in crowdfunding offerings like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, most of them will fail on their first try, by the way. That doesn't mean that you should give up after the first try. Usually you kind of figure out what you're doing, and then you can go after it again. All right, makes sense? Not to discourage you, but you should, uh, in the securities-based one, there's a higher percentage of success because you have a funding portal in the middle of it, but you can self-host it. We'll talk about it in a second. All right, property. Let's talk a little bit about real estate now. All right, and what types of properties are good uh, for crowdfunding? All right, so we're looking for other people's money to, uh, where are we at with time? All right, we're looking for other people's money to take us out, uh, to, to help us with real estate, to help us invest in real estate. So you can crowdfund anything, right? So you're going to put together a package, just kind of similar to the 506C that I'm passing around now, with the, you know, the disclosures, the warnings, the opportunity, the pro forma and everything. You can, you can attempt to crowdfund anything. So the current market, Title II, crowdfunding for real estate, this is Realty Mobile, Fundrise, iFunding, Realty Shares, Early Shares. The majority of them use a Title II crowdfunding exemption, or a Title II 506C, and uh, that's the exemption that they're using on their portal, right? And so this is kind of the, if you want to use a crowdfunding portal, these are kind of the guidelines for a crowdfunding portal, the type of deals that they like to take in. And we'll talk about the process of how, uh, of how you actually get accepted into a portal and what happens if a portal accepts you in and what to expect. Anyways, they like, you know, real estate was, or crowdfunding was tailor-made for real estate, especially like a hard money game. Uh, how many people are in real estate profession? Right? How many people, how many people are in the crowdfunding business? Do you have a portal? Yeah, who else has a portal? Portal, portal. You go, well, make sure that we have time. To, you know, you want to talk to these guys, their portals, and you know, I'll, I'll give you a second uh, to stand up and introduce yourself. Also, in a minute, but uh, anyways, so tailor made for uh, real estate. Uh, crowdfunding is tailor made for real estate. Kind of the hard money model. So deals that fit well with hard money fit well in the with the portals that are out there. So the property, relatively short term expected payout on one to three year structure structure to senior debt, 
or yeah, structure the senior debt. That's the 90% of the deals that are going through crowdfunding portals right now are structured in the short term, some sort of senior debt, very little equity. There are some in Fundrise and Realty Mobile, but most of it's short term debt products similar to hard money. What, what kind of products are you raising? Why well, you stand up and tell us your name and your portal? Hello. Yeah. Bernie Navarro we just launched a uh, portal named Fundrageous on Monday. Congratulations. What's it called? Fundrageous. Fundrage, what type of and, uh, 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 Our company was a private lender in South Florida in Bedford County. We decided to go into the crowdfunding model for those outside of geography and outside of the dollar amount that we were living with. So with Title II, right. is that the exemption you're yeah. using? And then what kind of deals are you with? Um, first mortgages. Kind of like Short term takeout, for yeah. Three years. Okay. And, uh, for, for, All right. For a bridge lender. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. What, what, tell, tell us a little bit about your phone. Nice to meet you. My name is Jonathan. Uh, I'm actually a real estate crowdfunding platform, but in France, and there is a regulation an exemption in France. Yeah, you to me in France. Yeah. 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 All, uh, all kinds of investors, not only uh, for French. Oh, oh, in France? France? Yeah. yeah, in France. The U.S. is behind in this, by the way. I don't know if the French are that far advanced, but the... Yeah, it's really recent, like six months ago. Australia kind of is really the... Right. Out there in the advanced. Who else have a portal? What do you have? Uh, it's a travel donation base. What is it? It's uh, basically it's a awesome. segmentation play of a Indiegogo. What's the name of it? Taking the, the medical category yeah. and expanding on it. Awesome. What is it? Pottery.com. Nice. Well, congratulations. You know, listen, uh, I think there, there already is, and there will be more so, a proliferation of crowdfunding portals. I mean, uh, so I'm doing this talk tomorrow at Georgetown uh, in D.C., and it, at the request of a professor and his uh, Georgetown professor and a Harvard professor invited me up there to give a talk about Ray A Plus because they want to do a portal. So portals will proliferate, but that's good news, by the way. We'll, we'll get a little bit more into it. Anyways, so if you're looking for real estate, just kind of think of a hard money model, right, where you have some kind of short-term takeout debt. We'll get into a capital stack here in a second. We'll do it. All right, so short-term, structure senior debt, men's debt, or preferred equity. We'll talk about what that means in a second. Investor money is ceded to the sponsor or the borrower, which is typical, right? That means that the person who's loaning you the money gets their money first or invest in your property first. Usually then the borrower within you. All right. Uh, uh, they believe that it mitigates risk, uh, overall risk by aligning the interest of these investors in the real estate company appropriately, meaning the investor gets the money first. All right. So listen, when you're doing real estate, I mean, uh, so take commercial real estate, they have what's called a capital stack. So capital stack, that just means, okay, how am I going to fund it, right? And who's going to be involved? Typically, the way a, capital, a, a traditional capital stack goes in a, in a um, residential property is, I put some kind of down payment, right? That's my equity part. And then I get some kind of loan. That's my debt part. That's my capital stack, right? So in crowdfunding or in commercial, I can have, I can have a multi-tiered capital stack where I would have someone puts up the money in the equity part, right? An institutional investor may come in and do some kind of debt or equity portion of it, and then someone else might come in and, and do a debt part. So they could have multi-tiered uh, uh, capital stacks. Typically, the, the crowdfunded part would be, well, it depends on which one. It's, it's typically debt usually senior to uh, all right, finding deals. Let's talk a little bit about finding. Anybody have any questions so far, by the way? I will dig into this and give you more examples. And we're going to, uh, I'll stop short and we'll just do case histories here uh, with the last half hour. So I'll show you deals that are funded. And we'll try to figure out how they did it. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm going to email you, uh, I'm going to email you a link to the Udemy course. Where are we at? Uh, by the way, those who came in late, uh, Jack, my dear friend, is recording this, and we're going to upload it into Udemy, and I'm fitting a lot in, and I'm, I'm purposely talking fast so that I can fit it all in. I'll expand it out on Udemy, and I'll give you guys a free pass to it since you're kind of sitting through this. I've kind of crammed eight hours of stuff into here, so, but I'm getting to it. Anyways, let's talk about finding deals, because, you know, there is no, there is no deal until you find it, right? So like I said, I just left Silver Bay, a big reef, where, you know, we bought hundreds of properties down here. And you know, deals are everywhere. You just 
what we're seeing in the proliferation of the portal space or the, in the crowdfunding is all these portals are popping up. The, the problem is with a lot of the portals, uh, at least the first generation of portals, is they were all techies trying to bring a tech solution to a deal-making problem. Does that make sense? And what this, um, yeah, I think I wrote your email about this. But, so what we see now is, what we need now in crowdfunding are deal guides. Does that make sense? People who can go out there and find deals, right? So, how do you find deals? I mean, I use May. May works with uh, Intel Realty. Uh, she sourced for Invitation Home, she sourced for me. But get yourself out there as a deal person. Start looking for deals. They're all over the place, by the way. And start analyzing and looking at them at a capital stack, right? So if somebody says they have a deal, you don't have to have the MLS to quantify it, but it helps, it makes it a little bit easier. But you can use tools like Trulia and Zillow to quantify it, but you just want to make sure that you use public record and not their estimate. You just want to, so when you're finding a deal, you want to see what the, app, the value is. So in real estate, the value, at least in residential real estate, it's based on comparable sales within the last six months, within a mile radius. So if you find a deal, start quantifying them, start analyzing them. So if they have a deal, you can put it up on Zillow and then just do recent sales. Make sure that it's a closed sale and not a pending sale. And then just look at the ones closest to it. And if it's a similar type property, similar make, similar construction, you can reasonably estimate that that deal is going to sell for what deals in its local area just kind of uh, sold for. But start putting yourself out there as a deal guy because deals will come to you. I mean, South Florida, it's tourism and real estate. There are so many deals down here, by the way. Big questions, comments, complaints, suggestions? Do you want to say something? Jack, are you on that, buddy? You want to say something about finding deals, young lady? Yes? When you say find a deal, do you mean like uh, a house that you're going to buy and then sell or a house you're going to rehab and then sell it? Well, any type of deal. I mean, what we need, what this industry needs right now is deals. You know, so look, I, no investor can invest in a, in, into a deal if there is no deal there. Is that makes a deal. There, it doesn't make a difference. Just make sure that you quantify it that there's an opportunity on the exit. Does that make sense? Yeah. So any kind of deal would be something where there's an upside to it, right? Does that make sense? So it can be a flip and rehab, it can be a buy and hold. Like I said earlier, that most of the crowdfunding deals are kind of short-term debt products right now, right? But, you know, we'll go over the case history. I mean, they're funding, crowdfunding everything from $121 million projects in New York City to what's the new Tower One that's going up? That, there's a crowdfunding portion to that, kind of talk about it. Um, so a deal is just a, uh, is just a real estate or finding deal kind of, uh, yeah, he's on right now. He's a man. We'll see if he's in focus this time, but I appreciate it. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, the thing right now is to make sure that there's an upside on the other uh, on the other end, right? That it's an investable deal, right? Make sure that they're, you know, the, what I see a lot, and this isn't in crowdfunding because they're going to get you, we'll go through the scrutinize the due diligence process and they'll usually get vetted out. But what I see in real estate is a lot of guys bring me deals, especially in my own analyst position at the REIT, is that they bring me deals that had zero upside. So my point on this is that if you're going to go, one, put yourself out there as a deal and when they come in, work through them. You have some kind of quantitative method. I'll go in deeper in the tools and techniques that we use at the REIT that I worked at, but just make sure that there's some kind of upside. Usually what I see is that there's an upside for the investor, but the syndicator or the deal guy forgot to forgot about itself. You know what I mean? So you want to make sure that the deals that you're bringing have make sense not only for the investor, but for you. Right? Because there are a lot of investors that don't have a problem with if you don't make any money. Or well, rightfully so though, because they're putting up all the risk. Anyways, I guess that's my point. Any questions? All right, analyzing deal, I think we talked about it. There are a lot of great tools out there. I mean, if you're a realtor uh, or if you're working with a realtor and you're looking for crowdfunding deals, make sure that they understand the investment side. I mean, it, you know, it, beauticians, it takes uh, more money, time, and training to become a beautician in the state of Florida than it does a realtor. I'm, look, I'm a licensed real estate professional, so I'm not knocking it. But I'm just saying that if you're going to work with one, make sure that they understand the investment side and they can quantify it. So that's cap rate, equity, exits, you know, debt, all that kind of stuff. I'll layer it in a little bit in the Udemy course on what, on how we did it. There are a lot of free tools out there, but you know, with the with the downturn and the proliferation of the institutional investor in the single family market. Uh, buying huge volumes of properties in South Florida and across the U.S. There are a lot of good quality real estate agents out there who understand how to analyze the properties for 
investable, right? So if you're going to use crowdfunding, it has to be an investable deal, I guess is my point. And if you're using a commercial agent, and there's no training that they have to go to become a commercial agent, but if they're any good or worth their salt, they'll definitely know how to calculate cap rate, IIR, or whatever. All right, getting ready to crowdfunding. Rules, best practices. All right, elements of uh, correct, uh, any questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions? Getting ready. Uh, the Jobs Act, I'm not going to read it to you, but the elements of the preparation, understanding compliance with securities rules and best practices. I can't state this enough. I mean, you just want to make sure that you talk with a securities uh, attorney, a broker dealer, or somebody who understands the securities laws, because if you try to circumvent them, you can get in a lot of trouble, right? Worst case, you can lose all of your money, well, best case you can lose all your money and have to get it back, worst case you can go to jail. So make sure that you understand the securities laws. If you go through a portal, we'll talk about portal selection, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. Just deciding on the deal structure, we talked about a lot of the different ways you can structure a deal from a 505, a 504, or a 506. A good broker dealer or securities attorney can kind of point you in the direction. In Title II, the portal that you're going with should be able to point you in the direction uh, of what deal structure you want. Creating the marketing plan, we'll get into that in a second. Getting the financials in shape. This is where most people fail, not only in crowdfunding, uh, well, I shouldn't say with the portals, the portals do a good job of it, but, um, but in like five or six Cs, or people looking for um, uh, investments for their deals, they just don't know their numbers. Do you know what I mean? You need to quantify this. You need to, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you have to just sit down and map it out. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm buying it for this. I'm estimating that I'm putting this much into it to take it to this value, right? But, you know, this is where a lot of people fail. Many's really good at it, by the way. But um, uh, where you, you know, look, a lot of people say, look, I can buy it for this, and if I put 5,000 in it, it'll be worth this, and then I can sell it for this. But what they do is they guess at the how much they have to put into it. So my point to you is, find the deal, walk the property, and put some uh, you know, analytical mind into it. You know, you can walk through, if you're getting into real estate investing, I would recommend that you walk through Home Depot and look at the prices for the different types of quality refrigerators and lights and fixtures, right? It doesn't take a lot of work to understand that, right? And then, if you're new to real estate investing, there are a lot of deals on the market. You know, we don't talk a lot about the foreclosure crisis because we worked through it, but I think there were 36,000 foreclosures done, I think it was in the state of Florida, it could be all over the U.S., right? That were done uh, last year, right? And there are all kinds of deals on the market right now. So you can just go on Zillow, you can go to a good foreclosure broker, or hell, you can call May and she'll start sending you deals. What was the one you found yesterday, the 480? Coral Gables, $480,000 completely written with mildew, right? But it copped out, like I told you how to cop out, tight, tight cop, uh, recent sales, within a few blocks, 855,000. So, tar the ask is 490? What did we put it, 460? 460, 150,000, we brought a contractor out there, and we think we can sell it for uh, 855. But those deals, how many you come across a ton of those, right? But she also works for an institution, and she's on the MLS every day. So, my point is this, is if you work at it, you can do it. It's not that mystical, right? Just walk it and put your mind to it and then make sure. I, I see this in new real estate investors all the time, especially when I was in the REIT. These poor guys would just be trying to get an exit out of something that was impossible. But just make sure that you do the analysis on the little, look, I can get it. Most people know what they can buy it for because that's a contract price, right? But it's the little gap, okay, if I put 10 grand into it, right? Just make sure that you walk the property, right? Make sure that you, if you don't know uh, what you're doing, most contractors will come out and do it for free, I think, uh, if, you, if you promise them the business. Make sure that you put your mind to it. Uh, because I see a lot of people that buy it, it was not like 150,000, it was 350,000. Now my exit is more than what the property can sell for, and they're just stuck, or they're upside down. And so, if there's any caution that I can tell you in the hundreds of real estate deals that I've been fortunate to be a part of, is make sure that you be mindful of the analysis of it. Walk every property. You know, you know I guess we didn't this over video. But anyways. Ensure the legal side of your house is in order, right? I went to 
I guess it's the, the size of the offer. I wouldn't do any offering without talking to a securities attorney first, right? If it's a, even if you're going through a portal, which we'll talk about here shortly, talk to an attorney. All right, where are you, how are we? Questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions? It's kind of elementary now. You went from all over your head with all these fancy stuff to elementary events, which is good. All right, creating an offering memorandum with your team. I think we've talked about that enough. Uh, Equity versus debt, we won't really get into it. Equity is rarely the right uh, choice when you're raising money, by the way. So let's say that we were raising money for a startup, right? You can do equity. Uh, equity means that they're part owner. Let's say that I have 100 shares in a company. Hey, how's it going, Robert? Talking about Silverbay, he's one of the contractors. If you need a good estimator, he used to work with me to estimate all my houses. I haven't seen you in a while. Anyways, uh, equity is rarely the answer, right? So. If I have 100 shares and uh, somebody, let's say that I say the, the, the company is worth $100, right? And they give me 50 or $40, right? I will give them 40% stake in that and I'll give them 40 of my 100 shares. Does that make sense, right? So in a new startup, when I put a value on the equity, I'm defining, you know how people like on the Shark Tank, they say, you know, uh, what's the value you're putting on that, right? So if I do debt, I can avoid putting a value on a new startup. I can do what's called convertible debt. Basically, you give me a loan, and then if down the road I decide to take equity out, then at that point your debt will be converted into equity. But what it does is it kind of, like we're going to get off topic, but it doesn't, it, it delays putting a valuation on a new startup, which can be very difficult, by the way. My point is this, is that when you're raising money, whether it's for a real estate investment or a company, or any kind of project, equity is rarely the first route that you want to go. Now, if you're working with two partners, right, you know, you want to split up equity. The only thing I can say about equity is mind your equity because once you're under 51%, you don't control that anymore. Does that make sense? Right? Uh, all right. Moving on. Pros and cons. Well, we got a lot to talk about, so this will be in there. All right, Mark, any questions, comments? Where are we at, man? Right. Ten minutes. Questions, comments? Like, is anybody crowdfunding an offering, a real estate offering? No. Usually I have two or three. Have you? We already, we already completed sold our first deal. Congratulations. Why don't you tell us about it? It was a three hundred thousand dollar loan that went pretty quick after our our launch to our investors. What kind of property? It was a single family residence for investment. So an investment, uh, a single family, not owner occupied, right? And what's the value of the property? So what's that, 75? 70, 70. What's your max LTV? 70. Okay. So that's a good deal. And then so what, you send it out to your crowdfunding? And then so what was the time frame? So they submitted the deal? The deal due diligence? Yeah, I don't know where else I'm trying to put it on. So basically they had a single family investment property. So look, if, if you're going to raise money, so securities law is one thing, right? Uh, and then there's the Dodd-Frank and all the mortgage laws is the, another thing that you have to be licensed with. And they I used to own a lender down here in South Florida. So when the when uh, everything went south, I had 50 brokers up in Florida and they changed the mortgage laws big time, right? So what a lot of, so if you're raising money for investment properties, it's much easier to raise money for a non owner occupied, right? Because if you're doing a, a loan for business purpose, you can circumvent the Dodd Frank laws. Does that make sense? So, anyways, get a non owner license. Well, you're a license lender too, but that's a non owner right? You can have a loan on your license lender. So, it's the only crowdfunding site that I've seen out there that's a license lender. Which is the way it needs to go, right? Which makes sense. But you can't crowdfund a, uh, I guess you could do, that just came up, you could do a crowdfunding takeout. So, you can't originate. A owner occupied to crowdfund. But I think you could crowdfund a tank out. You can't do a one to four, one to four unit property. Anything that's one to four units, single family, you shouldn't be. You should be allowed to fill. Yeah. One to four units. No, I. So Realty Mobile was asking me, look, do you think there'll be any crowdfunding participation in the owner occupied side? And I don't think there'll be direct participation, but maybe as a secondary takeout or a secondary part of it. Anyways, uh, so, look, Dodd Frank, Frank came out. Is Dodd Frank completely written yet? I don't even think they've written the entire thing. Did they? With the AML and the, the uh, last January, most of the laws came out. So, they, after the, the, the downturn, basically they, they blamed all the mortgage brokers, I guess, rightfully so. Um, 
And uh, they, they came out with the Dodd-Frank law that had all this uh, wide-reaching laws that on um, lenders and, you know, if you write, it used to be that if I were to write a mortgage, right, I would, I, I would write you a mortgage, I'd maybe take that loan and then I'd send it, sell it off to Fannie or Freddie or a secondary market, and I was no longer responsible for that. Dodd-Frank, now you have, what, is it the life of the entire loan? What they basically did in 2010 is they wrote this law, Dodd-Frank, and they said they left most of it unfinished until January, until January of 2015. So this is why the, the mortgage markets are a mess right now, is that a lot of the lenders don't really want to get in this space because they don't know the downside risk of it. Anyways, long story short, so fund rates, you do 70%. Is that your max LTV? Is that your max LTV? Does everyone understand what LTV is, loan to value? Right, if I calculate it. Right, so if I have a house, right, of hundred thousand dollars, so give me a, a hard money loan up to seventy percent. What are your terms? Anywhere from nine to thirteen percent. Nine to thirteen percent is pretty good. And do you qualify the growth, the the person or the property? So I mean, the property or the actual property. What what kind of experience? Do you have? We'll bring we'll bring you up a little bit. We'll bring you up a little bit later. No, it's the actual crowdfunding portal. One second, Robert. Any points? Any points? Yeah. How many? Two to four. Two to four, you come through me at six. Do you think the average fair value or do you cost back with the cost? I don't go to uh, future value. First question. All right. So we'll, we'll guess. Well, so traditional lending may not fit. So, I mean, say again. Well, so it's an option to you have that option, but you're limited out on the number of properties that you can refinance through traditional methods. So, is it ten still? It depends on the lender. Ten is the building Ten for residential. Yes. Trying to get deal. But there are a lot of funding options. By the way, this brings up a good point. We'll bring you up here a little bit later on, please. and we'll make sure we get all the answers questions possible. So listen, there are a lot of funding choices for real estate now. There's more debt available for real estate than there are properties. That's why this space needs, well, all real estate space needs deal makers, right? Uh, so, you know, definitely look, look at your sources or evaluate different sources before you choose one. So usually in crowdfunding and hard money, it's the, the time it takes to, right, because, you know, how long it takes from submission to funding. Right, so five days, I mean, I have a, so I'm in the single family rentals first business with Roberts, we just had a big conference, and you know, this one guy did a, a blind pool, we'll talk about what that is later, 720,000 in 72 hours, right? I mean, he had, he, he had, he was, he had experience in, with that portal and the investors, but as soon as he said, look, I got a pool of properties that I want to buy, it's 720 grand to make it happen, 72 hours later. He did, he did, he did go to a bank, and he did quick. If you go to a bank, that's probably your cheapest source. However, it doesn't mean it's the easiest. And look, interest rate is never the best uh, analytical tool to be used to analyze debt for acquisitions. That makes sense? It is one of many, but it is not the overlying concern. I see a lot of people, especially coming from the mortgage industry a long time ago in my career, is that they want to say that they got the best rate, but they forget about things like terms and prepayment penalties and you know balloon exposure and we won't get too much into that but just know it's not all about rate by the way you need to when you're when you're evaluating this source or any kind of funding source you need to know you need to know what your deal is you need to know your time frames in your deal and you should have your exit strategy especially on the investment side already mapped out and then based on your use case or or your or whatever your reasons are then use that as an analytical tool to determine which method you want to go forward with. Does that make sense? All right. All right, questions? These are great questions, by the way, I appreciate them. All right, marketing. We're going to dig into this a little bit de deeper, but first impressions in crowdfunding, it's, 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 a, it's a pair, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later. County, look, your county needs to be in place. Um, you know, you're bringing a lot of people depending. So, I talked about Title II, right, uh, earlier, and we'll, we'll I'll, clarify this on the Udemy course also. I know that's an easy out for now, so if you don't understand it, you can still raise your hand. But, so they have what's called a funding portal. 
Does everybody understand what a funding portal is? Right? Let me show you. So, uh, in crowdfunding, so let's say you want to raise money, right? This is you, you have a nice house that you want to raise, right? And then you have the investors here, right? And then there's something called a funding portal or a crowdfunding portal right now, right? In Title II, remember how I said that there were different titles? So Title II is really the only one that's legal right now. It's for accredited investors, it's what everyone's kind of using, right? You do not have to go through a funding portal. You can self-host this. Does that make sense? So that means that if I've got a house and I've got a database of people that I want to, to raise money through, I can write my own offering, I can upload it on a site, you can go to something like Theme Forest and you can self-host it right now. Does that make sense? And then you'll just throw it out there and then they'll come back. There's some provisions to that. You need to make sure that they're accredited. Uh, we'll get a little bit into that. So there's some legal uh, obstacles that you have to make sure are covered if you're going to self-host it, so the funding portals might be a better source. But right now with Title II, you don't need a funding portal. When we talk about Title III that's coming for the unaccredited, you have to go through a certified funding portal, which is like a broker-dealer, right? And then Title IV, you have to go through a funding portal as well. Anyways, so a funding portal is like Fundrage, right? Like Realty Mobile, like iShares, but what they're really good at is you don't have to go through them, but what they're really good at is that they're kind of niching out now, so like Fundrise is, uh, you know, the community, the commercial kind of big space. I don't know what the rest are, but oh, Patch Land is a hard money residential. I don't know what your niche is, but they're starting to niche out, and what they do is they have a database of accredited investors, right, that have been self-selected for that type of deal, right? So that's what allows, when you go to a funding portal, for you to be able to raise 720000 in 72 hours, right? That's what allows that they've already got, I think that Fundrise said that they have 45,000 registered accredited investors on their portal. They're waiting for your deals, right? So you don't have to go through them, but it might make sense to. What are your portal fees, you said? Uh, Points. Two, two to four points is yours. Uh, in, industry average is three to eight points, depending on, on, on the typical. Right. Is everyone following me? Are you good, Jack? She's typing up here, by the way. Oh, you're typing. Text me. Thank you very much. All right. Any questions? I guess follow me. Am I going too fast? Am I all over the place? Yes to most of it, but I'm assuming that. Well, the email's not, but the email's not as well. Oh, the Unity course? You know what? The book that I'm going to give you, I'll give it to you now. Book. So a good friend of mine, fundamerica.com forward slash book. You can download it for free. I mean, this, this book will get really into securities-based crowdfunding more so than I am now. And it will explain it. And he's written it brilliantly. And he used to charge a fortune for it, but he gives it away for free now. So download it. Fun America forward slash book. And he's a broker dealer, by the way. And uh, if you don't know him, you should. His name is Scott Cassell. He's one of the big founders. Yeah, uh, they do third party servicing, pairing, all that good stuff. Anyway, it's well done. Bob? I don't know if I can. I write back because I can't spell well. Scott? There's two L's. He's the man. He's a broker dealer out of Vegas. Uh, he also has a CFPB course that is amazing. Anyways, where were we? What were we talking about? All right. Accounting, make sure you have your accounting. Though well, these are securities. People are investing in these securities. So if you're not a, C a CPA, you should probably have a CPA involved, right? If you're going to self host it, does everyone understand the concept of the funding portal? Did I, did I clarify that well enough? Everyone understand it? So the other thing about a funding portal is that they're going to have the professionals to review and scrutinize your deal and the uh, and the, the syndicate. Does that make sense? So if you don't, if you're going to self-host it, you need to make sure CPA is looked at it. You need to get a securities attorney. You need to have uh, professionals involved. If you go through a funding portal before they take you on, they're going to do their due diligence and screen, and they'll have those professionals there. So when you start looking at the points, right? A lot of people get caught up in interest rate points, fees, right? You, what do you get for it is what you got to know. You know, does that make sense? Is that they all have their place, they all have their purpose, right? I don't mind if professionals charge their fees, so long as they earn their fees, right? Does that make sense? So as so long as I understand it, I always used to tell my salespeople, charge your fee, earn your fee. 
that makes sense? So don't use fees, points, rates as the only metric. Make sure you understand what you're getting for that metric. Make sense? All right, good enough. Questions, comments? Where are we with overall time? What time is it? Seven flat. All right, so I need to pick it up. Legal, we talked about Fund America, there it is. There. Offering memorandum, look. There's another one out of uh, Tampa from the guy that founded, who was the guy that got kicked off Shark Tank? The original Shark Tank guy. What's his name? Fundhub.com. What was that guy's name? You know what I'm talking about? You guys don't watch Shark Tank? Yeah. Who's the first guy who's no longer a shark? He was the Tupperware guy, the infomercial guy. Anyways, he started crowdfunding a uh, third party uh, company called Fundhub.biz. Uh, you can look it up and uh, they'll do a, a 506C uh, offering mem memorandum for 2500 ready for lawyer review. Lawyer review, by the way. They, will, they won't give it to you ready to use, but you can do it. Just know if you go through a funding portal, they're going to rewrite all that stuff for them, right? There we go. Right. Best practices are right. steps to success. Get ready, then post an offer to uh, an offer that investors will love with the required doc disclosures, of course. Right? So, I, I stated earlier that the majority of crowdfunding offers fail. I, I, I wouldn't say that if you're going through a, a funding portal, we'll talk about selection, right, earlier uh, or later. And, uh, but the reason why most of them fail is because of lack of proper preparation. People think that they're just going to throw it out there and they'll, they'll take a 60-day time frame and they'll work it out during the 60 days. Man, you want to get everything in order first. Make sure that it's an investable deal, a little bit like what we talked about. Make sure that your docs are in order and then put it up there, right? Build an army of evangelists. This is, the, this is the greatest thing about social media. We'll talk a little bit about it. I have a company called Funded by Design. I say it's a company, we really don't use it, but we have what's called a funding spoke in there. So in social media marketing, uh, the, way, the way it works, it's called Hub and Spoke. Has anybody ever heard of Hub and Spoke marketing? Right, so Hub and Spoke marketing works like this. Uh, we call it the funding spoke. But so this is your offering memorandum or your landing page, right? And then these are your social media sites. And then they all point back into your offering. That makes sense? So then I don't have a spoke or a net that I can capture as many people in. Let me tell you about social media, by the way. It doesn't have to be for a person. It doesn't have to be just for a person. You can build pages for your offering. You can build pages for your executive. You can build pages for your products. You can build pages for your services. And you can have a big, a, a big web. Really fast, short copy versus long copy in marketing. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? So short copy would be like a commercial that's a minute long, right? Long copy would be an infomercial, right? Long copy pulls 10 to 1 over short copy. Proven, that argument has been solved years ago, right? So what that means is a lot of people think that they need to be brief to, because people are so busy. Well, maybe, and you have to have a combination of short and long copy marketing. Short copy pulls them in, but it shows that when, especially in, in, a, in a, a technical investment like this, people want as much information as they can get as right now. Does that make sense? So when you're doing this, you want to make sure that when you're doing your funding spoke, that you have all of the, the one second, you have all of your long copy, everything explained and easily accessible. Yes. Okay. Yes. Of course. If you're doing your own offering and some of the things you're talking about, which you could do, and not go through a funding portal, whichever one you may decide, when you go out to all of your social media, there's more credibility when you say, go to X funding portal. I would like to be mine that it's not, go to X funding portal. My aunt, my cousin, my sister, my friend, go to this valid third party that can fund this, that's going to manage this, it's going to get the escrows, it's going to do everything that you need, it's going to manage your money well instead of you doing it. You could, you could do it. Good, it validates your project when you go through a funding portal. I've seen that. Yeah, well, you know what they, so the funding portal does the due diligence and selects. Good. Well, so look, I'm, you know, I'm meeting with the Georgetown, the Harvard guy. I would recommend they sell those. You know what I mean? They have the expertise at the talent levels. And they're building a REIT. So, you know, so the way it's going to go is that, so, you know, Right, I'm bringing stuff to the funding portal, and you are at the same time. Exactly. I'm bringing really investors, and you're bringing investors at the same time. Yeah. So the way it's going to go is that 
I think, I mean, uh, is that uh, lenders will have funding portals as part of their offering, or their, right? So you'll go to a funding portal. Now, if you're a big institutional player, you will have that, like, uh, so these, this, uh, uh, Professor Morse is his name, is they buy Class A properties in DC, right? And they're thinking about either going public with a billion dollar raise, that's, that's a stretch for anybody, I don't care who you are, right? Or sell funding their deals one at a time, right? So my suggestion to them is create a funding portal and this year, you know, save all of your investors a database and put one deal at a time on your own funding portal. By the way, if you haven't learned this now, you need to get it. But contacts are key. You should be saving everybody's contact information. You know, be, do, be very diligent about collecting people's information because you can get back in touch with them down the road. You can, you know, use them to fund your deals. You can fund their deals, right? And there's never been, if you're not collecting it now, you should start, right? I mean, uh, that's, it, that's all said. Anyway, so this is what I think is the revolution here. Is that so? What I said before, the unit. Where are we with time? I lost Jack. Jack! What? That's right. Anyways, so this is a funding, uh, a private place. This is a memorandum, right? This is what I said before. So, I remember I heard an interview with uh, one of uh, Warren Buffett's wives. He said, well, what's it like being married to the richest guy in the world? And they watch, right? He said, well, it's really boring because all he does is set up in his office and read memorandums, right? And business plans. So this is the old way, and this is still around, but this is the way if you're going to invest is that, you know, you get a memorandum and you have to read it, right? So, this is the revolution that I think. This is the digitization of the offering memorandum. It's called the pitch page. Well, I don't know if it's called, that's what I call it, right? So in any, in, in any funding portal, when you log on to Realty Mobile, let me know when it's 7.30, by the way, so we can just get a case study no matter where I'm at, right? When you log into Realty Mobile, if you want to invest now or fundraise, you're going to have a funding page. So this is uh, from Kickstarter, by the way. I didn't have one for this. But what this is, it's the digitization of the offering memorandum. So I can have a video from a person or of the diagrams or a 3D flyover of the site, right? So video is all the rage right now. One, it took technology to get to a point where we can upload it but uh, at a reasonable time. But right now, it's Every minute, there's 300, or every second, there's 300 hours of video being uploaded into YouTube. The proliferation of video is easy. It's because it's how we communicate, right? 5% of communication or 10% of communication is what we say. The rest, 95%, is how we say it. So when you communicate, video is the best way to do it. So anyways, this is a funding page. They almost all have some sort of video right here. They can interact with the person. They have updates up top where updates are key, right? So as we're going along, I can see what's going on in my fundraising effort. I can communicate with my investors. I can encourage them, right? They've got comments. They've got different backers here. There's a, a funding portal called Circle Up. Has anybody heard of this? It's a consumer products. Not consumer products, but like a grocery store kind of stuff. They're the best funding portal I've seen out there. That's not my space. But they have it. They got it. They got it. Have you seen some circle? You got to look into it. Really. They got it tuned in. So you can go in there and they've got um, star investors, like big time uh, VC guys will come in and they'll have their uh, own page. And then you can invest right alongside them, see what they're investing in. Uh, their products are usually in a grocery store, so here they'll have a video from the person, and then they'll give you, if you're interested in investing, they'll give you a coupon and they'll get the product for free. Does that make sense? So we'll see that this, that, that this is the real revolution, is the digitization of the offering memorandum. And not only is it, does it allow you to communicate with the potential offering in a more normal way, and long copy, it has everything at your fingertips, and it's updated, and it's also got social media and peer pressure with the backers on it, right, so on and so forth. But the real revolution, revelation, is that it is consumable on whatever media device you want, at whatever time you want, 24-7, right, on your laptop, on your uh, iPad, on your iPhone, or whatever. So, Accredited investors we talked about, right? Over a million in net worth, 250,000 a year. There are 8 million in the US, roughly, right? Of that, only roughly a million of them invested in rate D exemptions in 2012, I think, or 13, right? So less than, uh, roughly 10% of the people who could be investing these don't invest. Why? Because of deal flow. Look, most people who, who do well have a real job or a company that they're running 24 7, and though they would like to invest in 
and deals, they just don't have time to sit down and go out and find these guys. You know what one of the biggest pains in the butts about this, by the way, and, and the thing that Title II lifted, is that if I had a 506, uh, a 506, a 505, or a 504, I can't generally solicit this. I can't advertise it. The person has to be known to me. Does that make sense? So you see how difficult it was to raise money before? Look, I want to raise a million dollars, but I had to have a previous relationship with this person before I could even show my offering, right? Title II, what we were talking about, lifted the ban in solicitation. So now you can use all the powers of the internet to advertise and so on and so forth. Make sense? Right. Anyway, I think this is the revolution. Uh, revelation? Revolution? Uh, questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions? Company goals? You can see here, look, you need to put out, uh, so this is kind of my uh, equity one for startups also. But look, you need to uh, uh, map out a business plan for your real estate deals as well. Look, a lot of people just, they just kind of put it up there that, hey, look, I'm buying it for this, I'm going to put this in there, and we plan to exit, right? And it's not enough. You need to map out the time frame, right? And the more detailed you can be. Remember I said long copy pulls 10 to 1 versus short copy? Right? Short copy would be, uh, here's the price, here's what I'm putting in it, I plan to sell it. That's a short copy, right? Long copy is, here's what I'm buying it for, here what the comparables are, right? And I can start layering it in, right? Here, here's my investment plan, here's, here's what I think I can get for it, here's the person who did that inspection, here's the time frame for completion. You see how now I can start really laying it out? I plan on selling it at this time frame. I base the time that it's going to take to sell this based on you know, the average days on market, right? Does that make sense? So in this one, they lay out their business plan and a nice, this is a Kickstarter rewards kind of thing. This is what they're going to do with the money. And they made it out, nice graphic. Like I said, you can use things like Elance and Craigslist to hire people cheaply to make it look good. But we're, we're in the, the you know, we're in the age of the internet, you know. Make sure it looks good. Those little, the, the little tiny finishing, polishing touches really suck. Anyways, perks, reports, doesn't matter. So comments are a big thing, by the way. So this is in the law now. So moving forward, I have to tell too, that, is there anything about comments? I don't think so. No, so Title Three, where the unaccredited investors can invest. The thing about the internet is that it's permanent. The good and the bad, right? So they call people uh, fraudsters and everything uh, bad actors, right? And so the, everyone thinks that there's going to be a lot of uh, fraud in Title Three crowdfunding because a lot of people are going to create a lot of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, there should be less because the comment sections, right? And that if you've got a thousand people looking at one deal and someone spots it out, they can make a comment on it. And then another person can layer it on it. And the law in Title Three, you can't delete these. They have to be left up here, right? Permanently. So anyways, moving on. Let's, let's get through some of this. What time is it? What it looks like, we talked about this, we talked about this. It's a lot. All right, so a lot of people think that once you put up the, um, once you go to the funding portal and you put the deal up there, it's up to the funding portal to raise the money for you. True and not true, right? This is your deal. You want to make sure that you're doing your best effort once it goes live to keep bringing people in, right? Thank people. People who invest encourage them to bring their friends in, right? Uh, thank them for investing, yes. No, you can't pay commission. Uh, you cannot pay for commission. You, I, you could do a broker dealer or a registered securities person, but no, you can't. You can't pay money to raise money for. No, listen. A lot of people do. Uh, so, um, to a certain point, money motivates people, but most motivation is not monetarily driven. Does that make sense? Like people want to belong to something greater than themselves. People want to be led. People want to be encouraged for doing the right thing. People want their friends involved. You know what I mean? So if you can use those social, uh, yeah, exactly, and, and you, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll raise more money. Anyways, my point is this, is that, so you can do all of this uh, to get your offering ready, and once you list it, do not stop. Now that it's on there, make sure that you send your uh, database, uh, emails to your database, get the word out, let other people know about that your offering is live and where to go, where to send them to the, the funding portal, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Once it's, live, once it's live and active and ready for investing, that's when you get to work. That's when you lean in, as Sheryl Sandler would say. Well, uh, anyways, uh, moving on. Questions, comments, complaints, concerns, suggestions? Yes. And I run a scenario by Sure. Uh, I'm a hard-planned lender, mm -hmm. and if I lend somebody money to buy a property, and, and 
I have a personal on that property. Can I then crowdfund people to come in and buy that uh, loan from me? So that's exactly what <coughs> that's, that's basically what <coughs> Yes, yeah, it's kind of what Bernie does. But even you know, after I have my mortgage broker license, I mean, well, you got to be careful and you need to check with the securities attorney because here's the thing is that you can do it, but you need a, a, a memorandum, a title, a 506C memorandum offering, right? That it's, so you created a note, right? And now that a security, a debt instrument, right? And now you want people to invest into that. So you need an offering memorandum that explains what this investment is, the risk, the rewards, and everything in it. So go ahead. Project like that, no, you're getting the security loan. So if you have a bunch of people buying from you, you know, a lender or a portal, and have the security return. You can self-host it with 506C. That's how to do it. And that's what you're going to do that? It is, but you got to make sure that your offering memorandum is in check. Okay. What you just described is a funding portal, by the way. Uh, well, pretty much. Is that a, a Title II funding portal, right? So we talked about the difference between Title II and Title III. So Title III, when it comes around, that is going, you're going to have to be a licensed, registered mini broker dealer in order to do these Title III crowdfunding. One last question. Yeah. Uh, What's your name? Hilton, Hilton Johnson. How are we able to do all this if it's still illegal? What's the, it's, it's legal. It is legal. What were you saying earlier? It's illegal. Well, Title III. So this is where it gets complicated. So there are different titles. Remember I said that there are six titles, right? Right. Only Title II and Title IV are legal right now. Well, as far as the money, right? There's another one. So both of those, well, Title II, which Fundrage is, they use a Title II exemption, right, so that they can advertise these offerings. That can, that's only accredited investors. And so they change the way you do accreditation, too. So you have to be careful, is my point. Um, is that you have to make sure that before, all they had to do was say that they were accredited, right? Now, and if they checked it and they gave it to you, you're good, right? Now, you have to make sure, and, and there are all kinds of third party operators who make sure that they are, but you, just, you, just have, you can do that, and that is legal, the Title II part, you gotta be careful. Title III is not legal, which is the unaccredited investors being able to invest in a note like that. I'm just in the party. There you go. That's, I think that's kind of where we're gonna get to. Well, there's a lot of room for a lot of people. Does that make sense? Now, the game's kind of changed with dispersed portfolios of residential, where we have institutional players. And, but what happened? No? Yes. Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, my thing died? Patch of land does something that is not normal to the market, which is borrower uh, instruments. So if you're not investing into actual notes, you're investing into the company. Borrow dependent notes. Yeah. And those are something that we're going to have to the actual portal, we can get a little dicey, unraveling your investment. For sure. Well, you know, I think we invest into the actual note, everybody will be sort of a lot. Okay. Does everyone understand that? Does everybody, uh, so this is, yes. Okay. Uh, let's say I'm looking at a memorandum today and want to go to a funding portal. Would you recommend to doing one deal or trying to fund for a pool, like five deals, six deals at a time? So it depends. So this is the difference. Uh, so when you're looking to raise money, there are what are called specific offerings and blind pools. So a specific offering means that here's the property, here are the details. I can go out, I can touch it, I can inspect it. Right? The other one is a blind pool. A blind pool would be, hey, look, I'm looking for this type of property in this type of market, but I don't have them specific yet. Right? So specific offerings are much easier to raise money for because I can do my due diligence and quantify it. Blind pools are a little bit more difficult. You usually need more experience. Every portal is different. I don't know if you do blind pools. No, no we, uh, specific uh, only. Specific deals, and the investors invest in a specific deal. Their their name is attached to that. Okay, does that kind of answer your? Yeah. So on the invest, so the real revolution in crowdfunding is on the investment side. So that look, if I wanted to go and you know get so. Money, money that is not invested loses value, right? Everyone knows that a dollar from 100 years ago was worth a lot more than a dollar today, right? I could buy a lot more, right? You always hear your grandparents say a loaf of bread, right? So money that is not invested loses value. You need to invest the money at a greater uh, return than depreciation, right? Or the money's going to lose value. So, you know, 
that's what Wall Street and professional investors are all about. They have all these sophisticated analytical tools that allow them to analyze and quantify investments and returns. And so if I'm a accredited investor that you know owns a bread factory, I usually don't have those tools available to me or have more the time or inclination to want to go do that. Well, so crowdfunding has really changed that. What it does is now you can go to a, a site like his and I can log in as an investor and I've got all these offerings. This one here, and I can look in and say, oh, well, look, I can look at this guy's experience, I can see what he did, I can look at here, I can look at the analytics that they use, and then I can build a diversified portfolio. What's the minimum investment? 25,000. So 25,000, there are sites, I think past land is 5,000. So uh, I can make a diverse, I can do a diversified portfolio of investments for as little as five grand, where before crowdfunding portals, sorry, what's the name? Um, they, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it was just impossible to do. Make sense? Yes. I'm guessing what happens if someone were to default the loan when it's investors? You What's the rate? You manage it. Right, I manage the point. Right, 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 right. Go back to the problem. Because we've got a problem. We all have to pony up to, to pay the legal fees. If somebody doesn't want to pay the crowd, somebody may say, hey, uh, I, my, the buck stops here. I'm not going to put back, uh, good money after bad money. We have a provision for that too. His, his interest rate stops. He doesn't participate in the default interest. He doesn't uh, get any more interest out of it. You know, capital then? Right, capital. It's similar to a capital fund. So I understand it. So what, the question is, what happens if the deal goes south? So I invest in it, right? So it's a hundred thousand dollar deal, minimum twenty five thousand. Let's say you have four investors. What happens if the guy, you know, the tenant goes out and the, the property goes under? What happens? Right, so you take over the deal. You take over the deal, and we manage it proud, and we ask them, well, it's time to capital call, if you will. We need money for the attorney, and everybody has to do their percentage of what they invested in the deal. Now, if somebody doesn't want to participate in that, we have a provision for that. So we also have a business continuity plan, just in case if we go under, what happens to the deal? Who, who takes it over? Who manages it? The, the, the investor? with the highest percentage in the, in the note turns into the, the uh, general partner and he funds in a certain sort so it won't be, so it doesn't get into a legal platform. It doesn't sound like you get challenging to have 10 investors in a deal or say 100 investors in a deal. Well, so the... We also have the opportunity to sell the note. Does so the... They don't want to do it any, any. So this is the biggest challenge uh, moving forward with crowdfunding is that what happens when there are many investors in one in a cap table, right? The cap table is like the, the profit and loss of the, of the investment, right? It used to be that if I had only one person or whatever, if it failed, I could take back my collateral and move forward with it. Now if I've got 10 or 15 or 20 investors, how do you move forward? So these are great questions on the investor side when I'm selecting investments to invest in, by the way. These are really good. So the funding portal will usually take it over. It depends on the funding portal. You know, some of them are on luck. Right? But they'll usually manage it to to uh, whatever the Some funding portals haven't thought that through. I've seen a lot of them that haven't thought that through. And if you're bringing your investors to a funding portal, it's good to know that that's a great question. It's worth us a lot of time to, to, to develop a, a, a specific default policy and a business continuity plan. Do you have a second or not? None of them are licensed lender servicers. So that's another thing that they, there's another level of scrutiny. Do you sell services and name it yourself and then okay. take over back if you wanted to? I know it's not your business model, what you described it, but could you advance the funds? You gotta speak up though because we got a lot of people who can't hear you. Yeah. You advance the funds and take care of yourself. So you, so you want to follow your best, but you can take care of the model yourself. You can advance the, the, the fund yourself. Maybe we could. We could. Property that you could do that. We could, right? Then some of our attorneys well, as well make on a contingency basis. We have that as well. That could happen. So what was a, I did a, you know, so like I said, until 2015, nobody really cared about crowdfunding. Now everybody wants to know about crowdfunding. And because I've been involved in it for a few years, I get invited to a lot of interesting conferences. So we did a broker deal meeting in New York City, and all these questions come up. What happens if it fails, right? All investments, that's what happens when it fails, right? What's the downside risk? I, I personally think that a lot of them, we need a few of them to fail so that we can establish case law, so we can quantify our downside risk. So whenever you're investing, right, you want to know all of the provisions. 
you know, what's going to happen if it works out, and what's going to happen if it, if it doesn't. Right now, because, you know, whenever a judge rules on something, that is the law, it's case law going forward. If I can establish, I'm not a lawyer, by the way, so if a lawyer, I'm not right, you can correct me, but, so if they establish that that's the law going forward, right? So right now in crowdfunding, there is no, there is no way to completely quantify the downside risk because we haven't had any failures yet. We'll have them, and we'll see what happens there. On the accredited side, though, I mean, there are, look, uh, Title II crowdfunding is no different than what's been going on in 80 years. It's just now you can advertise. So, you know, in this memorandum, by the way, they don't all, we describe what happens in this one, and you have it in yours. You want to make sure you understand it before you invest. That's a great I just need to go to the internet. That's a great question, well, because when you're driving traffic to that, you have a product, you've got to be the, uh, whatever you're doing, Asking your investors to go to it, and then this is what happens. It's a, it's a big question, and a lot of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard a lot. Let me show you actually. Right. There hasn't been fraud, but there have been some that have been, that have been very successful to raise. Not having real estate, let's say they, they put up a product or something like that. They put up a product and they want to raise fifty thousand dollars and they raise three million dollars. So now they were taking trips to certain places and they're trying to and it, they didn't use the money where it was supposed to go and there's been some of that. So Kiva.org is a uh, who's heard of Kiva.org, anybody? So Kiva.org was like the original crowdfunding site, so they made mi micro loans to uh, People in third world countries or other countries, Haiti, I think was a big one too. And it was illegal for US residents to actually invest through Kiva.org to help these people, right? So they make micro loans to people with not a lot of means, right? So we can use that as the model of the case model for fraud. And in that, uh, there is a 97.5% repayment rate. Does that make sense? So an average bank repayment rate is probably in the 85, if that high. Does that make sense? So is there fraud? There's always going to be fraud. You're never going to get around fraud. You know, the other question that I have uh, kind of on that line is people always ask, so if it goes bad and my money's in this investment, can I put it in another investment? Well, no, right? So investing is all about risk reward, right? So that's all you have to look at. Identify what the risks are, make sure that you understand and quantify them, and then just make sure that you have an acceptable risk level for the return that you're getting, right? So why is hard money at 12%, right? Versus three, what's the current mortgage rate? Four, right? Why is one at four and one at 12? Because presumably hard money is a much riskier loan. There's less due diligence on it, sometimes, depending, right? They usually maybe don't go as deep into the, the credit and the uh, job history. So it's a riskier loan, therefore it has a riskier rate of return on it. Does that make sense? So it's all about risk reward, make sure that you quantify it. All right, so we're gonna do, if I can figure this out, uh, yeah, is there something I can put it on so I don't have to bend over? Yeah. Any other questions, comments? I'm glad that you're here for fundraising. These are great questions. Do you have any answers? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's all right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the barrel? Can you pick that up? Oh, you better. All right, let's log into some of these crowdfunding portals and I'll show you some examples. So, anybody heard of Prodigy Network, by the way? Yep. So, Prodigy Network's based out of here. So, you know, in a society like ours, with rule of law and transparency of markets, right? So, my, uh, fintech revolutions don't have as big an impact as they do in other countries where corruption is the norm, right? So, crowdfunding is prevalent in all uh, other types of countries around the world other than ours. We're actually kind of lagging in it, right? If it wasn't for the downturn, I don't think the crowdfunding really would have came as fast. So, Prodigy Network is uh, based out of. Prodigy Network is uh, based out of Columbia. He says he's been doing it forever. He raised $112 million for a, a development in um, New York. And uh, let's see if we can. Uh, Sorry about this, guys. We'll all be clear on you if you don't need it. Technical malfunction. Any other questions? Anyways, he raised 112 million dollars for uh, 120 million dollars for development in um, New York City. 
The capital stack was 36 million crowdfunded. Uh, so he says he's been doing it in Colombia for years, and basically he crowdfunded 36 million of it. Institutions put in 52, and the rest, the rest was a loan or some sort of mes debt. All right, let's see if I can get in. All right, so let's let's. Um, Uh, you want to go over your site? Yeah. Uh, dot com? R-E-G-R-A-G-E-O-U-S. R-E-G-E-O-U-S. Alright. On ranges. We'll go over a few of these and we'll dig into some of the deals. Right, so listen, um, there's going to be a proliferation, and there is a proliferation of crowdfunding portals now, uh, brand new, which is good. Um, make sure that you do some due diligence on the crowdfunding portals, uh, who you're going to do the raise with. Make sure that uh, if the crowdfunding portal is new, at least that the operator is uh, experienced and established in the, in the market that you're going in. Does that make sense? Like if, you know, I have a retail project where I want to raise money for retail and I'm going to someone like Patch Land who only does residential, probably not a good choice. All right, so what am I doing here? I know more than the notes for your private topic. Uh, what am I doing here? Can I log in and look at the deal? Are you there yet? Is this you? Oh, no, this is Ben. Like, what the hell is this? Like, like a cup in the Questions, comments, complaints? Are you getting your 20 bucks worth if you register early? Yes. Can you submit your offering to different portals so you have to do your own account? Uh, you can, well, so you can't raise money on twice. You know what I mean? I can't look. If I, look, if I got $100,000, I can't raise $100,000 twice on a $100,000 offering. So you can submit it to as many as you want, but once it's accepted, you're done. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's kind of more like a crowdfunding, like a rewards and donation based kind of thing. And um, so like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they frown on it, but people do it all the time. So uh, another question would be, can I do a, a, a Title IV like we talked about, the $50 million raise, and a Title II offering at the same time? Not on the same property, but like it's the same company? And maybe, you know, you'd have to go with an attorney and ask, uh, there's a lot of law around it. So this, you want to come log in? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll ask some questions about some important. <laughs> So this is a funding portal, by the way. Um, brand new Miami. Uh, so if I understand, so you were a hard, you were a lender before. You're fully licensed lender. So you know this is a uh, they make loans. So what's your uh, what's your type? Of, what kind of properties are you looking for? Single family commercial. Single family. Single family commercial from hundred thousand dollars to five million dollars. Single family and commercial. Minimum is a hundred thousand, and maximum is let's see, right? Five million. Five million. Okay. And this is, you know what? So uh, look, I mean, if you're thinking, if you're like a, a mortgage broker or a broker dealer or something like this, you can see that for someone in any situation, that this is a good option for lead generation as well, because if it doesn't meet the crowdfunding, he can just take it to his regular lender. So this might be a good option if somebody. You know, you need the money. So some of the, uh, why don't you go ahead and start walking us through. This is some of the marketing things that you talked about, how, how, it, how it works. That's a big deal right now because there's a lot of, a lot of education that needs to happen in crowdfunding. A lot of people don't know what crowdfunding is, how it works, how, how, you, you, know, how you get a deal done. So, yeah. Well, so how many people here are looking to invest in, in, in crowdfunding offerings? One, two, all right, so we'll, three, four. So we'll look at it as a uh, investor, real estate investor looking to raise money for an offering. So that's a video that we talked about. You talked about that for a minute. Let's stop the little video. I'm going to make sure we cover a few. That's okay. Oh, it's only a minute. Go ahead. So, uh, some questions to ask if I'm a real estate investor and I'm looking to raise money is one, 
where's your money coming from, right? Two, you know, when I get a deal under contract, I have a minimum amount of time that I can close on that, right? So how are you funding this, right? It's a good question to ask. Uh, so this, this is one of the most important things that I think. The funding spoke, the hub spoke part. Right, because we're bringing investors to the site, and you are as well. With that, we get the deals funded. So that's a big part of this whole thing. And then the credibility of the site is very important. And then, so do you have any deals over there you have to look at? Oh. Where's the deal that just funded? So, uh, so there are three different types of uh, uh, funding portals out there right now. The first one is where, look, I've got, a, I've done my own documents, I've done all my own due diligence. I just need somebody to put it on the internet and market it out there. So they have zero. They they don't have. All they do is they host it. They have no responsibility. They don't look at it. That's a, a type of site. And the next one is a uh, a funding um, a portal like this one, where they're going to you're going to bring in the deal. They're going to run it through due diligence or their analytics and select you. And if that's the case, typically you build a, a portfolio. Of your the three deals. We start with three deals. The middle one here is the one that went through. Um, Walk logger. So this is a, a, a $900,000 uh, warehouse in Boynton Beach right here. And uh, that Can we see the details? Yeah, we're, we're logging in right now. Oh. I'm getting it from Bill. Okay, I'll give it to you. I'm going to pass it up to you. Okay. What time is it? 737. All right. He's only got a couple, and then we'll, I'll show you some of the other things. Really quick. I'll show you the operating page of your this is good. Who was here for Patch of Land's demonstration? They were good too. They're good. They're good. Land. They're out of California. You know, the thing is, is that most of this started out in California. Why don't you get that ready? I'm going to do a couple others. All right. So let's look at some of the initial players here. Uh, so one of the big ones making all sorts of uh, strides is called Fundrise. You got to have your crap together to get on their portal, though. I can tell you that. Uh, so look, I'll tell you right now that they're doing the. Uh, can I log in? Uh, they're doing the Three World Trade Center. So here, th this would be an investor page. So I'm looking in here, right? So this is a. Uh, you can see here we have everything from a stabilized office to uh, 14 unit luxury Three World Trade Center. But this Three World Trade Center is tricky. So you can log into it and see, hey, we're crowdfunding. I remember when this came out, I set it up. Wow, this is a big uh, a movement for uh, crowdfunding. They're offering, they're crowdfunding the World Trade Center. They're not. What this is, and this is when you're looking at it, you can see is that they bought a bond on, so the, the, the World Trade Center issued a multi-million dollar bond, right, basically a loan. They bought, a, I think, like a $5 million, and they're crowdfunding their interest in that bond.